Right, we have a really fun morning ahead. We covered a lot of ground yesterday. We looked at internal transformation. We had examples from EY, GSK, and others in terms of what you need to do if you want to move from tactics to strategy. Today, we're looking at the external environment. We're looking at what companies and brands have done in terms of changing how they communicate and engage. Now, we have two really exciting case studies this morning, and then also insights into social media. And I want to begin with one of those case studies right now. We have all the way from Cisco, from the Bay Area, Cameron Craig. Now, Cameron has talked extensively about his time at one of the most famous, most iconic brands out there. That is Apple. And what a lot of you may not remember is Apple almost collapsed or went bankrupt over two decades ago. Cameron was there during the, the turnaround. He's got a wonderful story to tell you in terms of the lessons that he learned from that turnaround. So with that, let's give him a big hand. Come over to the stage, Cameron. Good morning, everyone. When I first started working with Apple in 1997, the company was in shambles. Steve Jobs had just returned, but this place that he founded on innovation and delight was a shadow of its former self. A bloated product mix, flops like the Macintosh TV, the Newton, the Macintosh Portable, a portable computer weighing in at 17 pounds and costing the equivalent of $10,000. Apple's share price tanking, sales sinking, and the headlines rotten to the core. It was like watching your favorite band just make a string of bad albums. You kept hoping and praying that one day they'll make great music again. And meanwhile, you keep buying them, but your hope is, is being given up every day. Little did I know, however, that over the course of the next decade, I'd be a part of what was to become the biggest corporate turnaround in global history. It still is today. My journey with Apple started in Sydney, Australia. That's where I was born. I worked for Porta Novelli, Apple's agency at the time there. Then I moved to Singapore, and I moved in-house with Apple. I became the Age Pacific uh, comms lead for a number of years. Uh, based in Singapore. And then from there, I got transferred to the mothership, Cupertino, California, where for the next seven or so years, I was a senior member of Apple's Mac uh, product PR team. Now, you all know parts of the Apple turnaround story, I'm sure. The company certainly did a lot of things right, not the least of which was to bring Steve Jobs himself back to the company that he founded. But I'm here to tell you, do not underestimate the role that communications play during that time either. I learned a ton of stuff during my time at Apple that I still apply every single day in my communications roles. Today, I'm gonna to take you through five principles, five lessons from that time that I think that you're gonna find really valuable too. So let's just get started. Number one, keep it simple. Let's take a look at the original press release for iPod. 1,000 songs in your pocket with iPod listening to music will never be the same again. Let's take a look at the original press release for iPhone. We are all born with the ultimate pointing device, our fingers. I'll let you read the rest, but I don't know if it's just me. I don't know if I'm just a comms geek, a PR geek. But that's poetry to me. Short words, short sentences, yet packed with emotion. As Steve liked to say, if a mere mortal could not understand our communications, then we had failed. And he didn't want to fail if you worked for Steve Jobs. But isn't it funny how easy it is for us to add complexity into all that we do? It's not too long before we're adding in those six-syllable words, that techno mumbo-jumbo into our 
press releases and stories and presentations and what have you, how do you keep yourself in check? Well, here's a couple of simple tools that I use pretty much on a daily basis. Number one, readability tests. You'll find these all over the internet. They're free. You run your communications through them, and it gives you a score out of 100. What you want to do is get an 80 to an 89. That means that the average 11-year-old kid can easily understand your communications. Another one that's kind of obvious, but not so obvious, is Google Translate. Now, not to actually translate your communications, but to hear how they would sound devoid of any kind of human emotion, because that's how your readers are going to read it. If you can't explain it to a six-year-old, you don't understand it yourself. You get the picture. But look, the easier your communications are to understand, the broader the reach. And I don't need to tell anyone in this room, the world is certainly a global place where English is not everyone's first language. Keep it simple. Number two, prioritize influencers and respect their time. Hard to believe now, but those Apple headlines in 1997, they are going from bad to worse. And you know the reporters that gave us the hardest time out of everyone? It was the technology and business reporters. So we'd have events coming up, we'd have you know, launches coming up. What are we going to do? Just keep on going back to those same technology and business reporters expecting different results. No. We expanded the list of media that we worked with to cover reporters who covered fashion, lifestyle, and design. And I remember the transition. Here I was in Singapore. My role was to round up the best lifestyle, fashion, design reporters from all around the Asia Pacific region and bring them to our launch events in San Francisco, New York, and other places. And the conversation with the newspaper editors, magazine editors, TV stations would usually go somewhere along the lines of, well, what are you coming to me for? Why don't you just go to the technology person? I don't cover that. To which we'd say, if you don't come to this event, your readers, your listeners, your viewers are going to be missing out on a moment in time. This is about technology moving from the back office, the den, into the kitchen and the living room with beautiful design and compelling consumer features. If you don't come to this event, your readers are going to miss out. And if we piqued their interest on that, inevitably, the next question was, well, I'm not going to travel from one side of the world to the other unless you tell me what this Apple product is that you're going to be launching. To which we'd say, sorry, we can't tell you. Secrecy, huge part of Apple's DNA. Still is, a little bit harder for them to keep things secret perhaps, but a huge part of the DNA. The thought of me giving any, way, any, any kind of information away about a forthcoming Apple product to anyone, friends, media, that just wasn't going to happen. So how did we get those reporters to travel from one side of the world to the other? Well, we got them to come. And part of it was we didn't work with huge lists of media. We focused on a relatively small numbers of reporters, and we built relations with them, relationships with them over time. It also helped by the things that we didn't do. We didn't send a press release for every time Steve Jobs had a chai tea. We reserved them for only the most important things. This meant that when we called up the reporters, they returned our calls. We didn't waste their time. This is a tactic that Apple is still doing today. It's a tactic that I'm still doing today in my communications role. As an example of that, just recently, the company that I work for, we're a startup, we, we make smart windows. We did um, a, a survey on what are the work perks that are most important to employees in North America. And we came up with some really uh, interesting data that natural light and a good view rank much higher than fancy treadmill desks and gymnasiums and bring your dog to work day and what have you. So we could have sent out a press release for it, but we thought, what's the publication that really would go to people who might be interested in our products and services? And resoundingly, we all said Harvard Business Review. So we went out to them and it got published. And from there, it got published in a whole bunch of other publications who picked it up, broadcast media, no press release. The lesson 
you don't need a sledgehammer to kill a gnat. Am I anti-press release? Am I anti doing these big announcements? I'm not. Sometimes you're a public company, you've got something important to say to shareholders or another audience, you have to get it out there. But if you're not a large public company, if you're a smaller company, you've got an addition to middle management, consider putting it on your blog. The thing is, look at all of us in this room. There's more communicators by a far greater number than there are reporters in this world today. You overplay your hand and they'll stop listening. Prioritize influencers and respect their time. That was number two. Number three, get hands on. Boy, did we get hands on at Apple. We never sent out a product to a product reviewer unless that product reviewer had had a really thorough product briefing. Now, what do I mean by that? We take them through why we design the edges that way, round versus square. Why we designed the button that way. Why we decided to take out the port at the back. And when we did send out the product eventually, we followed up. Was the review going on message? If not, we ramped up efforts to course correct. Was there a tech problem? It wasn't uncommon on a Saturday afternoon working in the, living in the West Coast to get a, a, a call or an email, a text from a product reviewer on the East Coast. You'd be on a red-eye flight that night and at their home on a Sunday morning attending to it. Military-like precision for those product reviews. And from the CEO down at Apple, everyone would be watching these reviews. This is the first time that people you know, had hands on, on the Apple babies, if you like, the products. Very, very important. So what can you take away from this? Maybe you, you don't work for an app. What can you take away from it? If you've got a product, don't just send it out. Drop it around to a reporter. Take them through it. If you've got some news, back it up with an analyst reference, a customer reference, anything that you can do to you know, put the story in your favor. And if you run into a problem, fix it. Great example of this not so long ago. Look at this. This is Consumer Reports in the US. This is a really important publication. This had never happened before. MacBook Pros failed to earn Consumer Reports recommendation. What do you think Apple's communications team did when they got in that Monday morning and saw this? Kind of went, hmm, maybe the afternoon is going to get a little bit better than the morning. Chalk it up to a bad day. No. I'm sure that they went to product marketing, they went to the engineers and went, we've got to do something about this now. Apple's head of product marketing, he took it to Twitter. We don't understand why our tests don't jive with consumer reports. We're going to look into this, we're going to get back to you. A week goes by. Some people probably already forgotten about it by now. Nothing happens. A week and a half goes by, still nothing's happened. Two weeks have gone by, still nothing's happened, and people have probably forgotten about it. Two and a half weeks go by, boom, Consumer Reports now recommends MacBook Pros. That's what I mean by hands-on. The other thing I mean by hands-on is it started from the top. When I disclosed to Harvard Business Review a couple of years ago that Steve Jobs read and approved every single press release that came out of Apple, the world were shocked. Communications people around the world were, oh my gosh, Business Insider even ran it as a headline. How could this be so? But in my mind, a good CEO prioritizes communications. It's just as important for them to understand a sales spreadsheet, a progress report. And surely you're not sending out those press releases every single day. You're reserving them for only the most important bits of news prioritizing influences and respecting their time. So yeah, I think a good CEO is hands-on with communication. Number four, stay focused. We had but one primary mission in Apple's communications team. And that was to tell the story of how our innovative products were giving customers the power to unleash their own creativity and change the world. Anything that got in the way of that mission was the enemy. And there were plenty of enemies dressed in friends' clothing. 
I'm not kidding you. I would come to work every day with three hours time difference behind the East Coast. So before you've even got to your desk and made your coffee, there's emails in there, there's voicemails, a whole bunch of reporters at any given moment promising coverage, big coverage. Hey, it's the Wall Street Journal. Want to know what you think of the latest event from Samsung yesterday? Hey, it's the Washington Post. Want to know what you thought of the president's address last night? Imagine how that would play out these days. Number three, you know, uh, Los Angeles Times, where does Apple stand on climate warning? But if these inquiries didn't move the mission forward, we politely declined. And it drove media nuts at the time, but we were a relatively small team. People don't understand that. We didn't even have a press, we didn't even have a PR agency. The Apple still doesn't use a PR agency in, um, in North America. So any time that we would spend on those types of requests that weren't going to move the mission forward was time that we couldn't get back. The thing is, your job as a communicator is not to get in that, whatever that publication might be, whatever that broadcast outlet might be. Your job is to define your message, stick with it, and find the right place to tell your target audience about it. And I get it. In today's world, when there is less media, it's tempting to go after anything and waste time. You see people do it all the time, but you can't afford to do that. Number four, stay focused. Last one. Number five, become the influencer. I firmly believe that everyone can do this. Let me illustrate it with a story. A few years ago, I was working with a company called Polycom that some of you might know. They make that little triangle conference phone that is pretty much in every conference room around the world. And within the first few days of starting at Polycom, there was a bring your kids to work day. And I met this gentleman. He's the co-founder of Polycom, Jeff Rodman. And, you know, here it is, bring your kids to work day. He's telling this bunch of 10 and 11 year old kids a story. And they're all leaning into it. I have kids around that age too, and it's hard to get their attention. But he had them wrapped. And he's telling this story of how back in the day, he went to a Radio Shack store, a little do-it-yourself electronic shop, and he spied on one of the walls a 95-cent book on building speakers. He took it home, he read it, and essentially that 95-cent book led to the creation of this $2 billion company called Polycom that has these conference phones all around the world. And I said to Jeff, that's an amazing story. In fact, Jeff reminded me at that moment in time of someone that I'd worked with earlier in my career. Anyone know who this gentleman is? Johnny Cash. Believe it or not, I was Johnny Cash's tour publicist for his final two tours of Australia and New Zealand. And at that time, Johnny Cash was working with an American producer called Rick Rubin, a much younger guy. And he was essentially helping Johnny Cash to find a whole new audience of young people. And he was very successful in the last few years of Johnny Cash's life. He enjoyed a remarkable, reinvigorated career. He had something relevant to say to people. And I thought, Jeff, you should be telling this story to the next generation of Silicon Valley startup founders or startup founders, wherever they might be in the world. This is a great business case, a great example of storytelling. How come I've never heard this story before? So I helped Jeff craft a little piece. It got published in Wide magazine. But getting back to my point of your job is to get your message, the right message to the right audience. In my heart of hearts, I felt Wide's a good publication, but do Polycom customers really potentially read Wide magazine every day? I don't think so. What would they read? What do they read? Well, Harvard Business Review. So we took this story, we made some edits, and boom, it got published in HBR. Jeff's Twitter handle went through the roof. People all around the world got translated into many different languages. To us, we had other media kept coming to us. Then we started getting conference speaking opportunities. Jeff spoke at Startup Grind alongside the co-founders of WhatsApp, Waze, and Tinder a few weeks later. 
He was this guy who couldn't get arrested outside of the very narrow confines of the unified communication space that covered Polycom. And here he is with fans and followers. I've done a similar thing myself. A few years ago, I started toying with writing articles on communications on LinkedIn. And I got a few likes and comments from people. And it gave me enough confidence to go out there and pitch my stories to a broader audience. And I got published. Well, that's pretty much the reason why I'm here today. Alex saw some of my work and the other organizers saw some of my work and I submitted it. And they said, hey, come to Bahrain for this, this conference. So you see what's happening here? When you become an influencer, you don't have to chase things all of the time. And that's a great place to be in today's world with less media, less reporters out there. Now, there's probably one or two cynics in the room. Maybe they haven't had enough coffee this morning or what have you. And they're going, yeah, but I don't have a Steve Jobs at my company. I don't, this Jeff guy sounds interesting, but we don't have anyone like him. I challenge that. Jeff's story that got published in Harvard Business Review that took him on that speaking circuit had been around for 26 years. No one had thought to tell it. Imagine what you've got lurking inside your organization, your company. You too can become the influencer. So do I believe that communications played a key role in Apple's turnaround? I certainly do. And I think part of it was because of these five principles. Let's recap them really briefly. Number one, keep it simple. Remember the poetry of those Apple press releases. Number two, prioritize influencers and respect their time. No sending out press releases to everyone every day. Prioritize. Three, get hands-on. The military precision of those Apple's reviews programs still going on today. Four, stay focused. Right message to the right audience. And number five, yes, you too can become the influencer. Well, with that, I think that we have time for one or two questions. Oh, one more thing. It wouldn't be an Apple presentation unless there was one more thing, right? You got time for one more? All right. It's probably my favorite. Number six, motivate from the outside in. Let's cast our minds back to 1997 one more time. If you weren't old enough, just imagine that you were there. There was Apple covered in bad. Bad headlines, bad financials, bad sales. But most of all, bad employee morale. There were people like me, there were people who'd been there a lot longer than I had, who loved Apple. They loved that Steve Jobs had come back to this company that he founded. But at this particular stage in the Apple journey, they needed a reason to believe again. One of the first things that I worked on, one of the first projects in 1997, was Think Different. Anyone remember that? brand campaign featuring leaders from the 20th century. Rather than me talk about it, let's take a look at it right now. The ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. So that was 20 years ago. It still holds up, right? What's the one thing that that commercial, that brand campaign didn't have? Can anyone tell me? A product. We didn't have a product. Steve Jobs had just returned back to the company. Things sucked. That would take a long time. But Think Different came out and it signaled this new direction for Apple. And it won a ton of awards. It still references one of the greatest brand campaigns that ever, ever came to be. But the biggest impact that Think Different had and the story that never gets told about it is what it did inside Apple. And I'm gonna tell you that story right now. So when Think Different comes out, Steve invites a bunch of Apple employees 
to his home in Palo Alto, California. And he shows them Think Different. Now, some of them had probably already seen it. Some of them hadn't. But in the intimacy of that setting, his home, 45 seconds of black and white footage, no new product, no nothing, 45 seconds of air, he gives them belief in the future of Apple. Yeah, it won a ton of awards and people still talk about Think Different today, but what it did inside Apple, it worked a miracle. The thing is, transformative communication should always work from the outside in. It's not as though there's this strategic divide between internal and external. But when you're going through a, a turnaround, the bad stuff will come in whether you like it or you don't. The good stuff, you have to work it. We took early sparks of success, maybe a great product review, a great story, and we'd make sure that we brought that back to employees. And I've done that pretty much at every other place that I've worked at. I've done it at every place I've worked at, as I'm sure that a lot of you have here. As Peter Drucker once said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. But what he didn't say is that a good communications person, a good communications team, are the culture makers inside of an organization. And that's why I'm still excited about being a communicator today. My job is not about just to change the world's perception of a company or an organization. It's to change it from within. Thank you very much. I don't know if we have time for questions, Alex. Or... We, we do. We have a couple of minutes. So who's going to ask the first question about Apple? We, by see. the way, we have loads of Apple addicts around here because half of the presentations are on Apple Max. <laughs> Cameron, thank you for that. That was an excellent start to the day. It's lovely to see a true pro in action. You've been there, done it, and got the T-shirt. Um, <laughs> which bit gives you the biggest buzz? You work rock and roll, you work Windows, you work Apple, and probably lots, lots more. What gives you the biggest buzz now? Ah, oh, gee. Um, you know, it's funny, because when I first started working you know, for Apple, um, you know, I was in my 20s and, and I guess, um, you know, people at family gatherings always said, what are you working for Apple for? They're a technology company. I thought that you were really into music. But as we know, Apple became, pretty much became the music industry, you know. So for me, I, I love working for those big transformational companies that are reinventing something. And I've got that with my current job and I, I get really excited about that. And um, that's just the kind of thing that, that, um, that I like. I saw somebody else put their hand up as well. There you go. Okay. Um, that was amazing, so thank you. Um, you were talking about um, working with a small team and staying defined on the mission. So I think all of us probably resonate with that sense of, there, you know, there's a thousand requests coming in, and some of them it's easy to push back and go, well, you know, that really doesn't make sense. But how do you work with the internal customers within the organization when things are kind of on the blurry line? Yeah, they would make sense to do that. But when things are, how do you really keep that clarity about this supports what we're doing and this is how I say no? Yeah, great question. Uh, look, I mean, the, the simple answer to it is that sometimes we weren't very popular. You know, I mean, everyone has a new person who joins their team there's always software updates that are going out the whole time and what have you. And there were even products that came out that didn't even have a press release. And the poor, you know, people, that's their job, that's what they live and they breathe. It's kind of hard for them to understand, but, um, but there was a reason for that. And um, I think it's, you know, it was the big events when things were doing well and you'd see the reaction from people that made it really worthwhile. And that's what you want to focus on versus a thousand different little things every day maybe work on one really big thing uh, every you know, three months or whatever it might be. Great question though. Hi, Hi. Uh, behind the cameras. Um, Steve Jobs' personality is well documented and her, his mercurial nature uh, is well known. But can you share with us what kind of strategies you can use with um, a CEO with 
that kind of strength and weaknesses to mm. your advantage? Because many of our CEOs share similar traits. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I'd say don't believe everything that you, you read about Steve Jobs or anyone else. Um, kind of goes without saying, but sometimes people get fascinated by things. Um, you know, I think, um, uh, and we talked about this yesterday, storytelling is really powerful. And I do, like I said, I believe that everyone has a story inside of them. And I think that's when a communicator can really show their true value. It's, you know, I always say to people, before you decide what's interesting about you, go and ask the five people sitting at your table or, or people that have known you for a long time what they find interesting about you. And you'll probably get a much different response than coming up for it you know, yourself. So I think helping them in, uh, in storytelling and being authentic and guiding through change, those types of things are really important, whether you're a Steve Jobs or if you're working at a startup or wherever you might be. So you said one last thing. I'll say one last question. Okay. Thank you. That was wonderful. Uh, my question to you is when you work for a brand which is really there, um, you know, how do you really maintain the consistency from a communication standpoint? What is that one or two things that really keeps you up in the night? How do you keep the brand consistency Absolutely. when you're working for like a high quality, high performing brand like an Apple? Um, gee, um, I mean, we worked really hard, you know. Um, uh, we wouldn't let things go, you know. Um, we, we never settled. Um, I still have a lot of friends who work there and, I, and I, I can see their phones going off on the weekends and I'm, sometimes I'm glad that I don't have to deal with that anymore. But, you know, you never, never settle anything. I mean, that quality is so important um, that just don't, don't let uh, things slide. And if, you, and if things go wrong, fix it. Like I said, no one's perfect. Things do go wrong. Um, but, but fix it. Don't let it go.